Um, we're going to do two things today, which is learn how to take the derivatives of quotients and take the derivatives of um, trigonometric functions. So we will dive right in. Um, I don't have any intuition for you as far as the quotient rule goes. The derivative is strange looking. There is no getting around that. And it's kind of cumbersome to use, but sometimes you have to buckle down and master strange and cumbersome things. The derivative of a quotient is a quotient, first of all. So I guess that's nice. In the top, there's going to go something that looks a little like the product rule, but isn't. We're going to have the derivative of the top times the bottom. And we're going to have the derivative of the bottom <coughs> times the top. But those expressions are going to be separated via subtraction not division. And of course, not to belabor the obvious here, but when you do subtraction, order matters. I mean, A minus B and B minus A are different things. So it's important to get this order down. The derivative of the top, the derivative of the bottom. Um, and then in the bottom of the fraction, there are no derivatives, but the denominator is suddenly being squared. And I don't have anything brilliant to say about this. You've just got to do examples until it's sort of fixed into your memory. Let's take the derivative of a rational function, maybe a quadratic divided by a cubic. As I say, I don't really have anything brilliant to say it's what we in the west, the east coast called thug and chug. Here I hear thug and play. We just take the derivatives we're told to take and we stick them into the right places in the formula. And we hopefully don't make any mistakes while simplifying it. So it's the derivative of the top, first of all. And the bottom is left alone. <coughs> I know I'm writing a little small. The offer remains open to join me in Zoom if you are ever having trouble seeing this stuff. Minus, and then, well, we are just out of space here. I mean, writing small isn't going to help. So let's go down the line. Minus, and now the top. We leave alone. It's 
this denominator whose derivative we take. And this whole thing is divided by the denominator squared. And there's really, I'm afraid, no excuse for leaving the top looking like that. We should try to do something with it um, to make it a little prettier. I, I, sort of limits to what we can do though. It's going to end up being some kind of ugly polynomial, but we'll foil this out. So two X to the fourth, plus just yell if you think I'm doing something wrong, plus two X minus 2x cubed minus 2 minus, okay, this is a little nicer, 3x to the fourth minus 6x cubed plus three X squared, all divided by X cubed plus one squared. And now I'm going, I'm going to keep messing around with this. Um, I don't want to go to a new phrase. So I'm going to sort of talk about this as I mess around. This subtraction is going to distribute over these parentheses. So we're going to have negative 3x to the fourth, positive 6x cubed, negative 3x squared. And now let's look for like terms. Um, we've got a 2x to the fourth minus 3x to the fourth. So that's going to give us a negative x to the fourth. A negative x to the fourth. Then we've got a 6x cubed and a negative 2x cubed. So that's going to give us a 4x cubed. Let's see. Four, three, two, one, zero. Let's call that good. We could rearrange our terms so that our um, our you know four x cubed. I mean negative x to the fourth plus four x cubed minus three x squared plus two x minus two. That would be a slightly more conventional way of writing this but I'm going to leave it be. As for the denominator, I don't know. I mean, this top is definitely more simplified than this top. Whether or not foiling out that denominator is making things more or less simple seems to me to be kind of a matter of opinion. Like if you want to find the vertical asymptotes of this function, if you want to find where the denominator is zero, it's much easier to do with the denominator factored than it would be if we foiled that out. 
So on the other hand, if we wanted to find the horizontal asymptotes, we would need to FOIL it out. So there's no one sort of one size fits all to answer to the question, is it better to be factored or in standard form? I'm just going to leave it be, I think. What you're going to see a lot in the quizzes, by the way, is questions that look like this. Here's a function, take its derivative, then evaluate the derivative at some number. And that's how I get around the problem that two different students might end up with different looking answers. Because whether you FOIL this or not, you'll get the same thing if you plug some number into it. So if you're doing the quizzes and wondering where all of those questions are coming for from, that's the rationale behind them. And that's the quotient rule. I mean, as I say, I think it's one of those things you just kind of need to practice with, but does anybody have any concrete questions about this. Okay. That, that should bring us to the end of section 3.3. And the next thing we are going to do is derivative of trigonometric functions. And um, in a sense, there's not much to say about these either. In another sense, it's six math facts that need to be committed to memory. So even if there's not a huge amount to say about it, it's maybe not the easiest section. We'll start with the derivative of the sine function. The trig functions are self-contained in the sense that whenever you do calculus with a trig function, you wind up with another trig function or another combination of trig functions. My statement that the derivative of the sine is the cosine, I am not going to give any kind of formal argument for, but I would like to look at the sine and the cosine and see if we can make sense of this. Here's the sine of x and here is the cosine of x. Sine in red, cosine in blue. So remember that the derivative is the slope of the tangent line. Around the origin, the tangent line is x and x has a slope of one. So at the origin, the derivative should be one. Over here at pi divided by two,
failing a little, but over here at pi divided by two, the tangent line is horizontal. And a horizontal line is a constant function. It has a slope of zero. So at pi divided by two, the derivative ought to be zero. And also, let's see, at pi, three pi divided by two. You see here, once again, this tangent line is horizontal. The slope of a horizontal line is zero. So the derivative here at three pi over two ought to be zero. Let's see if I can make this most do this, keep pressing the wrong buttons. Here at two pi, this tangent line, I mean, it's not obvious, but when we draw the tangent line, y minus zero equals one, x minus two pi, here's the tangent line. And this tangent line has a slope of one. So the derivative ought to be one at two pi. So here's our function, here are one more, here's pi comma zero. The tangent line at pi comma zero, if you draw it in, what am I doing? has a slope of negative one. So at pi, the derivative ought to be negative one. Let me change that color. So here's the sign. Here are a bunch of points that the derivative ought to be going through. Here's the cosine, and the cosine does go through all of those points. So even without some kind of formal argument, if we just carefully analyze the graph, this looks like it should be true. And it is true. We perhaps won't spend so much time looking at graphs with these others. The derivative of the cosine is the negative sine. And by the way, I said at the beginning of this course that in the calculus, your calculator needs to be in radian mode. You need to always measure your angles in radians. These two formulas are only true if x is measured in radians. 
degrees. If you measure X in degrees, you get a bunch of ugly constants floating around. So here's a very concrete case where it matters whether you're measuring angles in degrees or in radians. So I've said that in the calculus, in addition to the sine, cosine, tangent, the secant tends to be very important. And now we're going to see a reason for this, because if you have the tangent function, which we hopefully can agree is important, and you start doing calculus with it, you start taking derivatives, suddenly the secant shows up. Unfortunately, some of these derivatives are a little messy. The derivative of the tangent isn't just the secant, it's the secant squared. Let's remind ourselves, maybe pre-calc was a while ago, when we write a power between the name of the trig function and the variable, what we mean is we're taking the entire trig function and we're squaring it. We write the power here because doing We write the, the, okay, I'm not, oh, there we go. We write the power there just because if we wrote it here, it would look like the X is being squared instead of the secant. So it's just a matter of clarity. Let's try to get that out. So these are the, um, I would say the famous trig functions. Like if, God, you're probably all too young to have read the far side, but if Gary Larson were writing a far side cartoon and he has someone doing math on a chalkboard. These are the functions you might see him use in his equations because they're the ones that he's heard of. But there are three more trig functions, including the secant and since um, we've said that the secant is sort of inheriting its importance from the tangent, we might ask if there are any functions that similarly inherit their importance from the secant. Maybe if we take the derivative of the secant, we'll get cosecants or cotangents. But that does not turn out to be true. The derivative of the secant is kind of an odd looking derivative because the secant appears in its own differentiation formula. The derivative of the secant is the secant times the tangent. This leaves us, sorry, I mean, I know I'm going fast, but I don't really know how to slow this. Maybe, maybe we can do before we finish this out. 
maybe we can do an example or two just to give us some breathing room. Now that we have trig functions, we can build examples that aren't just polynomials. For example, we could look at x squared times the sine of x. And we could ask for this derivative. And now making sense of something I said long ago, way back in section 1.2, I said how important it was to be able to recognize things like products when they occur. You need to recognize here that we've got two functions being multiplied together. And if we want the derivative, we are going to have to use the product rule. So the derivative of x squared is 2x. The sine of x we leave alone plus and now x squared we leave alone. The derivative of the sine is the cosine. And something you are probably noticing is that products tend to become more complicated when you differentiate them. And there's not really anything you can do about that. It's just a fact of life when you're messing around with products. But you see, we go from one product to two products connected by a sum. Um, similarly, if we had a quotient involving a trig function, um, let's do uh, may no longer remember, but at one point we looked at functions that looks like sine of x over x. We talked about the limit of this function as x approaches zero. Now that we know the derivative of the sine and we have the quotient rule, we could find the derivative of this. And we are, by the way, pretty soon, probably next week, maybe the week after, going to look at applications of calculus. So for now, I'm just putting formulas on the board, learn how to do this, learn how to do this, memorize this. We are going to see how this stuff gets used by the end of the semester. We just, I mean, we need to have our toolbox before we use it. Anyway, how's it go? We take the derivative of the numerator first and leave the denominator alone. We subtract. We take the derivative of the denominator and leave the numerator alone. And then, then in the bottom, x squared. And aside from erasing this one, 
Okay. There isn't really any simplification you can do with this. Just like the product rule, the quotient rule tends to take things and make them more complicated when you differentiate. Here's something we could do. Here's kind of a cute thing. We've given the derivative of the sine, the derivative of the cosine, and the derivative of the tangent. I tried to sort of argue graphically that the derivative of the sine really is the cosine. And the derivative of the cosine, you could do the same thing. Thought points on Desmos and show that the negative sine connects them. The derivative of the tangent, I put on the whiteboard for you, but we could have just figured that out. if we found the derivative of the sine of x divided by the cosine of x. Because by definition, that's what the tangent is. It's the quotient of two functions. And then we would have maybe have had to do some work getting this to be the secant squared, but let's see if we can fight through this. And if we really do get what I've claimed we ought to get. Let's see, the derivative of the top times the bottom minus. And now we leave the top alone. The derivative of the cosine is the negative sine all divided by, we don't take any derivatives down here, we just square what we've got. So divided by the cosine squared. And that's the cosine times the cosine is the cosine squared. The sine times the sine is the sine squared. And we see we have these two negative signs, so they're going to cancel and give us this addition. So at first blush, it might seem like we have not succeeded. This certainly doesn't immediately look like the secant squared. But here's where all of those identities that you were forced to learn at some point in pre-calculus can come to the rescue. Now we see how this stuff actually gets used. The Pythagorean identity says that the cosine squared plus the sine squared is just one. So this is a much more simple fraction than it seems. This is one divided by the cosine squared. We can rewrite that as one divided by the cosine, 
the entire fraction squared and one divided by the cosine is indeed the secant. So the derivative of the tangent really is the secant squared. Using the quotient rule, the derivative of the sine and the derivative of the cosine. Any questions so far? Let me just put the other two on the board. We don't, I mean, living with you, we don't care that much about the cosecant and the cotangent. I mean, we've said sort of the sine and the cosine and the tangent are important. The secant inherits importance because it shows up when you take the derivative of the tangent. But when you do take the derivative of the secant, you get the secant and the tangent again. So in a sense, the sine, the cosine, the tangent, and the secant form sort of a self-contained set of functions. You can do calculus with these until you're sick of it, and the cosecant and the cotangent won't show up if they weren't there at the beginning. Still, you should, I won't say memorize exactly because so much of this class is open notes, but you should at least see all of the trig functions. The derivative of the cosecant is Give me a second. The negative cosecant times the cotangent. And the derivative of the cotangent is the negative cosecant squared. And this is, if you were going to commit these to memory, it's, you've got the sine and, oof, that looks like division. I don't want that. You've got the sine and the derivative of the sine is the cosine. You've got the tangent and the derivative of the tangent is the secant square. And you've got the secant and the derivative of the secant is the secant times the tangent. Oh, not again. If you compare these functions to their co-functions, the cosine 
hexapenegative sign. And this co-function, this co-sine, loses the co and becomes the sine. The co-tangent picks up a negative sign, and this secant gains a co and becomes the co secant squared. So unused to cosecants that I'm forgetting how to write them, that's CSC. The um, cosecant picks up a negative sign, and these functions become co-functions. And that's how I always remember the cotangent and the cosecant. You saw me hesitate, perhaps, while I was writing those down. I had to hesitate because I was thinking, let me see, the derivative of the tangent is the secant squared. So the derivative of the cotangent is the negative cosecant squared. And I just do that every time I need either the cotangent or the cosecant. I would say in practice, at least, at least those four should just be committed to memory. I mean, stuff might be given open notes, but it's possible, I mean, you can have a French test that's open notes, but if you don't know how to say to be or any basic vocabulary, you're still going to have a bad time on that French test. And it's the same thing here. The sine and the cosine, at least, are going to show up so often in so many examples. It would be really hard if you have to look those up every time you need them. So I wouldn't stress about the cotangent and the cosecant, but at the other four, you should just know and have at the tip of your tongue. And I mean, when I learned how to this, it was AP in high school, and we learned these trig functions. And then the next day, our teacher wouldn't let us in the classroom until we could recite all of these derivatives. I'm not going to do that, but you should get these down quickly. And tomorrow, we're going to drill. It's not very... Uh, exciting, but the material we learned in this week is if you've mastered this material, you can do the rest of the course. If you haven't, you can't. I mean, that's basically what it comes down to. So we'll spend a day tomorrow just doing problems, drilling with this stuff, trying to make sure that we're all on the same page. And I will see you then.